You know what that means. Class is in. So I'm going to have you guys hand out your note sheet, which is the part of our ongoing series here uh, that we are uh, doing uh, for uh, the next uh, number of weeks, months, couple of few months here, where we are taking you guys through the uh, elements of the Christian faith. We have decided that in this period, we're going to create a slightly different series for you guys. We're going to create the introduct we're going to give you the introductory content that you might get if you were taking an, uh, a basic systematic theology course, a Christianity 101 kind of a course. And we're going to give you notes each week to help you learn some of these uh, essential elements of the historic Christian faith. We're going to bring in some uh, expert witnesses. We've been doing that uh, each week as well. Uh, and we're also offering a time for questions and answers. And so each Sunday uh, of the series, we've been giving you uh, these, uh, these different options, a very different kind of a series for us. Uh, but we felt like it was important because we know that a number of you are either seeking, you haven't yet crossed the line of faith, you haven't decided yet whether Christianity is right for you. Others of you are brand new in your faith. And so this is uh, offering a very solid, uh, hopefully a solid foundation for the rest of your Christian experience. And others, though you've been followers of Christ for some time, you've never had the approach to learning about this, the, this core set of basic beliefs, just for one reason or another, because of your uh, religious heritage, your background, whatever it might be, you never had an opportunity like this. And so we decided rather than simply offer a couple of side classes, we would just do it here for all of you. And so it's a, it is a little bit of a different series uh, for you guys, but uh, as we work through the material and the information, uh, I hope that you, if you have any questions, you'll jot them down or you'll text them to us, as you can see on the back of your note sheet, uh, the instructions on how to do that if you're not comfortable in asking them uh, out, loud, out loud. So we've been talking uh, about the Bible. Uh, then we talked about God. In fact, we answered all your questions about God last week. So if you missed that, I'm sorry, but we, we, sell, we solved all the big questions about God last week. And today we're going to do all of that, uh, the same exact thing for Jesus. So we're going to be answering all of the possible questions you could ever come up with uh, about Jesus here in the next uh, 25 minutes. And so um, the, it's kind of a, an interesting uh, question. In Luke chapter uh, 9, Jesus is speaking to uh, his disciples. He says, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elisha, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. You can almost imagine if Jesus were asking this very question here today, who do you say that I am? Who do the crowd say, and who do you say? And my hope is that this morning, you will be in some ways challenged to come to grips with this very question. There's uh, one of these man-on-the-street interviews kinds of things that asks uh, a whole bunch of random strangers uh, who they think Jesus was. And here's what, uh, here's what they said. Who do you say Jesus was? I have no idea. Who was Jesus? Gosh, I have to start with, I'm not sure. Who was Jesus to you? Some guy. Actually, I don't believe in Jesus. Not really sure exactly who Jesus was. I think Jesus was uh, was a was kind of a cool guy back in his day. Who was Jesus to you? <laughs> I think I'm done. I don't like to talk about it. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Who do you think Jesus was or is? Uh, Jesus was a historical figure. I believe that Jesus Christ was the man who had an extraordinary ability to link in with the creator. I think he was uh, definitely someone that people, you know, a good role model. I, I do think he had a lot of great ideas. More or less he was just a prophet, which is just a messenger of God. Sort of a revolutionary in his day. Jesus was an amazing man. I don't believe he's God's son. I just believe he's a person. As to his, like, God-like quality, I'm not totally sold on that. You think he was a prophet? And I would, see, I'd have to be Christian to really believe that. Jesus was the Messiah for some people, and for some people he wasn't. I'm not necessarily sure if Jesus was the Messiah or a prophet, but in either case, he was somebody that spoke the word of God. He was equal portions of, of human and, uh, and that energy that is God. People said he was sent by God. Well, no one, God doesn't send him down. You don't go on up. <laughs> I mean, you... 
he linked in. I mean, I do believe in Jesus in the sense of like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. That I'm, I'm not saying that he, he didn't exist or anything of the sort, but the fact that, um, I mean, I necessarily don't go and uh, pray to Jesus. Who was Jesus? Uh, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus was the son of God. I believe Jesus is the son of God who came to save us all from our sins. Jesus was a savior. Who died for our sins and cleaned us, made us pure enough to enter God's glory. The um, only way you can get to heaven. Who do you think Jesus is? Um, who do I think he is? I, I don't think it's who he was. I think he still is Jesus. So. He's not gone or anything, you know. I guess in body technically he is, but he's still here. The Jesus story sort of borders on history and myth for me. Um, but I don't believe that it could have permeated our culture so fully and for so long if there was nothing to that. So the first fill in the blank there on your sheet, the first side of it, this is pretty profound. Jesus is a real man. He is a real man. Historians at this stage in uh, our uh, understanding of the ancient world, uh, they consider this a ridiculous question that we now have to answer. See, many people have this idea that uh, we can still believe, and even some people here, that he was a myth, that he actually never even existed, that there's no evidence whatsoever that Jesus ever lived. And here we are forming a world religion on him, and uh, the guy was never even real. Uh, this is uh, an old idea uh, and uh, had gotten a lot of uh, uh, airtime in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, which today uh, there are no real historians, um, liberal or conservative, who would agree with that even though it's still promoted in some of the popular uh, books or TVs, uh, TV shows and things like that, um, it just simply isn't believed anymore. You have to start, of course, with the biographies that we have written, these Gospels. And these Gospels have to be dealt with. There's uh, eyewitness testimony that we have handed down throughout history. In addition to them, we have the Epistles written very early. They, some say that uh, Galatians by Paul would have been written in the 40s, 50s, maybe 60s. So you're talking about a decade or two after the time of Christ. Uh, these are historical documents that we would have to come to grips with uh, and uh, explain away. And there are countless of them. Uh, there are also other early Christian sources, and this is something that's often overlooked. Outside of the Bible, as you would expect, there was a, a group of early Christians who knew the apostles, but may not have met Christ. And they told the story uh, that the apostles told to them. And so these were people who reported from a very early day, and we have their writings still today, uh, that Jesus actually did exist. And they tell us what the early Christians believed. So this would be like you, or three or four or five of you, telling me something that you knew had happened, and me completely discounting it. Me saying, no, I don't, I don't believe anything you have to say. I don't have to deal with that because you're not in any way reliable or trustworthy. You have to, these are people who, who spoke to the people who saw. Uh, these are guys like uh, uh, Papias and Ignatius and Polycarp. Uh, you'll see their, little na their names written down here. They were writing from between 50 and 150 A.D., very, very early. And we still have uh, their documents. So uh, there are also countless thousands of other references uh, to Jesus in uh, the early Christian literature. So that's, that, that's the first major part, the preponderance of the evidence that would have to be dealt with uh, to, to really question or discredit uh, and to, you know, to question whether or not Jesus existed. There are also non-Christian sources, which sometimes you'll hear people say outright, there's not a single reference to Jesus outside of the Bible. You can't trust it as if for some reason, those documents are not trustworthy, which is an irony all in itself. But in addition, they'll just say, there's no evidence whatsoever that he existed. And yet there is. Here's an expert telling us a little bit about some of these early sources. A lot sources. of people assume that we don't know much about Jesus outside the New Testament. In fact, it's, it's frequently said that we don't know anything about Jesus outside the New Testament. Wouldn't people be surprised to find out that we have about a dozen and a half sources for him 
within about 100, 100 and a half years after the ministry of Jesus. And these report aspects all the way through his life. Now you might think that these secular sources shy away from divine attributions of Jesus, but they really don't. For example, Roman governor Pliny tells us that Christians gathered on a particular day of the week before dawn and sang hymns to Jesus as unto a God. Now that's a really interesting reference. And then he tried to persecute some of these Christians and he also made the remark that true Christians never walked away from their faith. The earliest source we have is Thallus, a historian who was reporting a Mediterranean history and he records a miracle. He talks about the darkness that surrounded the world when Jesus was crucified. We have reports of his, his resurrection but the fact that's recorded in secular sources more than any other one, about 12 of the 18 sources tell us that Jesus died, many of them telling us details, what happened to him, he died by crucifixion, etc. But about two-thirds of the sources we have tell us he died. So it's things like this that keep historians from saying Jesus never lived. We really do have good historical evidence. So from that, we know uh, that uh, Jesus uh without uh, question, was a real historical figure. Uh, most historians now just find it laughable that we're still debating this uh, 100 years after it's been settled uh, and well established. Um, but with that comes some other interesting things. Since we know that he was a real man, we know that he was most likely a carpenter from his biographies. We know as well uh, that he was a Jew. We know that he was from Galilee. So we even have an idea of what he may have looked like. Now, he's not the Jesus that many of you have, have come to know from the childhood pictures. He's not, I'm sorry for the Scandinavians here, but he's not the blonde hair, blue eyed. You ever notice how he always looks a little bit like effeminate? Uh, you know, he's kind of on, this, this is not the picture. We, recent archaeologists have uncovered a better picture of Jesus. And he, he looks more like, you know, like this next picture. That's it. Darker, hard, like he looks more like me. Um, I mean, I'm just, so, you know, with that kind of a, you know, that machismo thing going on. In fact, sometimes you wonder, because, you know, in the scriptures, he'll often walk through a crowd of people, or when they came to get him in the garden, you know, people say, oh, they saw his power, that's why they backed off. I think this guy, he was hardened, he was a carpenter, I think he popped up there, and he's like, it's me. And everyone's like, whoa, hey, whoa, he's, just, he's a big dude. In fact, I would like to get a newer version of Jesus out there in the popular culture. I think this picture is... I don't want to say it's like a Fabio, thing, but it's like the hair. I, this is, some of you are like, oh, he's so cute. But, you know, this is like, that's the picture that I want to prove. Obviously, we, know not, we have no idea what Jesus uh, really did look like. But what we do know from the scriptures is that he experienced the full range of humanity's emotions, we, such as the hurt of betrayal or the loneliness he felt. You remember there's a few, see sometimes we get this idea of Jesus as sort of this superhuman and we, we begin to rob him of his essential humanity. So we think of him as sort of uh, impossibly uh, beyond our experiences. How could he possibly, he was, he was so much more of a man, he was so much this, this epic and mythic figure that we keep, we paint these pictures of him as serene in all circumstances. Uh, and yet though he may have been settled in confidence, there certainly is indication throughout the scriptures that he would experience the full range of emotions. When Lazarus died, we find him weeping. I don't think he was simply weeping for Lazarus. I think he understood in a way that we don't the full gravity of the, of the pain of sin and death in this world. I think that's what would break his heart. I think he saw the rebellious uh, nature of his people and that broke his heart. I think he knew that when he was in the garden, he wanted his friends to be there to support him, and they, they weren't, I think he felt the sting of that. He came out and even said, he's like, you can't just stay awake with me for a little while. You can hear the, 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 the ache in his, in his words when he's speaking to those that he most trusted and loved to, to watch his back, and they're, they're falling asleep in a, in a few hours of prayer with him. I think for me that uh, one of the crystallizing moments is in the garden when he's praying, and he says, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, please let it. If there's any way I don't have to go to the cross. See, we don't, we don't think about this, but this is such, it's rooted in, it's the experience that all of us would have in facing a, a difficult and, uh, and a challenging hardship. We would have this kind 
of emotional experience. Some people say, you know, what was the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think it was a messianic and a prophetic claim, and I think it betrays the heart that is being separated in some un unbelievable way from the, the power of the Father. I don't understand it all, but there's some depth and experience of the fullness of humanity that, that Jesus participated in, and it made him and allowed him to be the kind of high priest who knows of our struggles, uh, of our hurts, of our loss, our suffering. All right, that's uh, the first uh, part there. The second fill in there is that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And this is both a claim uh, of the scriptures. With that comes the fact that he existed before he uh, came here to earth. He has always existed as uh, God. And he will forever exist as well. He's the second person of the Trinity, which we spoke a little bit about last week, uh, this, uh, this triune nature of God. And he claimed it, and others claimed it about him, even very, very early in the Christian traditions. Open up, if you would, in your textbook to John chapter 1, starting in uh, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. While you're opening up there, it's... You know, there's uh, some interesting conversations in some of the circles now about how, you know, when you, you know when you get to know someone at first, you're like, wow, they're really great people. They're, they're fun, they're outgoing, they're gregarious, and you have a really great impression of them. And then when you get to really know them, you get to, you get to see who they really are, and you still like them a lot, especially if they're decent people, but you know the full story of who they really are because you've, you've spent a lot more time with them, and you realize, well, they're just human just like I am, and we all have our issues, and so you sort of have a, a slightly qualified view. Uh, a lot of people like to point out the qualified view of the people who knew Jesus most, uh, most intimately and clearly. Uh, this is not the kind of thing people would say about, about anyone else that they got to know uh, with uh, the kind of uh, intensity and familiarity that the disciples got to know Jesus, and yet they still were able to say these kinds uh, of things. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you see that in the very beginning was the word. He's picking up on the Genesis 1-1 uh, kind of language in the beginning, God. And the word, we find out the word here uh, was the word incarnate, they call it, and that uh, is John's way of referring to Jesus in the early part of this, this chapter. And the word was with God, but it wasn't enough to simply be with God in the beginning. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. He's describing the Genesis 1-1 creative act to Jesus. This is a, a, a significant statement, and not the only one, of the, uh, of the deity of Christ, as Jesus is God. Let's take a look at that verse on your note sheet there, John 8, 58. Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Last week, we introduced the idea that uh, God, when he was talking to Moses and he said, tell me, uh, who do I tell the, the Israelites sent me? And God said, you tell them the I am sent you. The I was, I am, I will always be. I am the self-existent one. And here, Jesus is saying, uh, before Abraham was born, I am. And if there's any debate as to what his audience thought about this, about this claim, you can see it right here. They picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. We have uh, a video from uh, Lee Strobel telling us a little bit about some of these claims about his deity. Did Jesus clearly claim to be the Son of God? What does the historical record actually show? Well, let's go back to the very earliest biography we have about Jesus. That would be the Gospel of Mark, the earliest one, and see what it says. Well, what we find as we open up the book the New Testament, we look at the Gospel of Mark. Some people say, well, here's evidence that Jesus only considered himself to be a mere human being. Because if you look at Mark, what you notice is most often the most common way Jesus referred to himself was the Son of Man. <laughs> so he's called himself a Son of Man. He's, he's, in other words, emphasizing his humanity. And so this idea that he's God must have developed in mythology and legend a long time later. But actually, the opposite is true. Because the Son of Man is actually a reference to the Old Testament book of Daniel in the seventh chapter, where the Son of Man is a divine figure who has authority and glory and sovereign power, 
who receives worship from all people, only God is worship, remember, and who will come at the end of the world to judge humankind and to rule forever. In other words, Jesus' claim to being the Son of Man is actually a claim to divinity. And by the way, there is a reference in Mark where Jesus is specifically called the Son of God. But one of my favorite claims to deity in this earliest gospel, this gospel of Mark, is often overlooked. You might remember that Mark, in chapter 6, tells the story of Jesus walking across the water. And as he walks across the water, he says to his disciples, if you read the Bible, it says, he says, fear not, it is I. Well, that's not exactly what he said. Because if you look at the original Greek, it's the language in which the New Testament was written, that's, that kind of masks the actual words of Jesus. Jesus didn't actually say, fear not, it is I. What Jesus said was, fear not, I am. Fear not, I am. What was he doing there? When he said, I am, he was applying to himself the divine name, I am, which is what God used to reveal himself to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. So, again, Jesus was clearly claiming that he's God. He's revealing himself as the one that with the same divine power over nature, able to walk on water, as the Old Testament talks about God himself. Also in Mark, when Jesus is being tried, the high priest asks him point blank, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And the first two words out of his mouth are, I am. And then he said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So again, this is a reference to that divine passage in Daniel. So what's the reaction when he says this? Immediately, the high priest understands what Jesus is saying. Immediately, he declares blasphemy. Why? Because he knows Jesus obviously is declaring himself to be God, and that is blasphemy. So his audience knew exactly what he was saying when he made that claim to be God. All through the Gospels, we see this happening. In John 10, verse 30, Jesus declares outright, the Father and I are one. And if you study that word in the Greek, what it means is one in essence. We are one in essence. And his audience, what did they do? They immediately picked up stones to try to stone him to death for blasphemy because, listen to what they say, you, a mere man, claim to be God. It was clear to them he was making that assertion. There was no ambiguity. Also, Jesus forgave sins. Only God can do that. Jesus accepted worship. Only God can be worshipped. When Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus didn't correct him. Instead, he affirmed that this was revealed to him by the Father. British theologian John Stott put it this way. He said, Jesus made it absolutely clear by word and by deed that to know him is to know God. To see him is to see God. To believe in him is to believe in God. To receive him is to receive God. To reject Him is to reject God. And to honor Him is to honor God. On the back of the sheet, you see a few uh, blank uh, lines there. There is uh, an old... uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, he uh, created uh, or repopularized this idea of what what has been called the trilemma. And uh, largely what he's done, and it's been adjusted here to have four parts, so whatever you would call a trilemma with four parts, that's what this is, uh, quadrilemma or quadlemma or something like that. Whatever that is, is what we're about to do here. And it, it goes through taking some of these assumptions that we've already spoken about and some of the things that we know to be true, and it forces a more concrete decision upon us. See, many of the folks in the video, and many people that, in the early video, and many people that you meet today, They'll pick and choose what part of the Christ story they want to embrace. They'll decide which parts are for them and which parts are not and which parts they like and which parts they want to reject. But from what we know, this gets increasingly difficult to do. One of the reasons I've emphasized the the claims that Christ made about himself is because you have to fit those into your picture of who Christ really is. 
It's not so easy to just simply say, oh, he was a good man, or he was a prophet, or he was this. How do you deal with the things that he said about himself, or that the others said about him, or he allowed to be said about himself? So the first line there, Jesus is a liar. That is one possibility. He said these things about himself, but they simply weren't true, and he knew it. But he didn't care. He wanted other people to think that he was God, that he held their salvation and afterlife in the palm of his hand, that he, be, that, he be, that he wanted them to believe that he could forgive their sins, even the sins that they had committed, not against him, but against others and against God. I mean, you're talking about the, the kind of an epic lie here that is, uh, you know, the, it, it does not uh, bode well for the idea of him being a good moral teacher. Good moral teachers don't say stuff like this. They don't lie about their very essence and their very, uh, you know, their very nature. They don't lie and try to, try to claim to be this hope of the world, the light of the world. So would you, like to, would you like to put Jesus in the liar category? That's what he was. He was a liar. He knew it wasn't true. And the man who gave us some of the best moral teachings the world has ever known was at the very core an evil liar trying to deceive people so incongruous. You could also say, the next line there, that um, he really did believe it, which would of course mean he's a lunatic. Because if anyone walks in here, I mean, you know, somebody walks in here starting to, they're claiming to be Jesus Christ, I think we would want him to, to back that claim up a little bit. More than likely, we would assume anyone claiming to be, uh, you know, Jesus Christ uh, reborn here on earth or God themselves, we would pretty much We'd want to get like the meds regulated or we'd want to find out where they escaped from and you know we because this is a big claim like you get you better be able to get the mojo to back this thing up because this is not you know you know, mostly we we don't these 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 delusions of grandeur i mean come on we don't take them seriously and yet here we have a a man if he really if he wasn't a liar if he really did believe it about himself but it wasn't true then you're talking about him, he, he's, he is absolutely certifiably insane. So that's another picture you can have. He's either a liar or he is a lunatic. Now, that's where Lewis's trilemma stopped, but uh, there is another category that has been much more popular today. And this is the idea that he's a legend, that he is a legend. Not that he himself didn't exist. Most, uh, everyone will grant that he did, but they'll say that he was simply a man but the legend of his deity came many, many, many years later. Now, we've talked a little bit about this when we spoke about the Bible because of the reliability uh, and the early date of a lot of these texts, even the witnesses that we're talking about here, like Polycarp and uh, Eusebius and other historians. Uh, the idea that this amount of legend, making a mere mortal into a divine savior, uh, accumulating in a couple of decades, uh, is so uh, preposterous as never to have been seen in history before. And so the idea that he could have, that, that the early church could have crafted it. Now, when, when we used to believe that, uh, and you'll hear this kicked around every once in a while, I think this is even the, uh, a big idea in uh, like uh, the old Da Vinci Code idea, that it came hundreds of years later, hundreds of years before anybody acknowledged that Jesus, you know, would have claimed to have been God or anything. That's why it was the early church that created the, the mythology. Uh, nowadays, you just can't hold that with the amount of evidence we have manuscript-wise and historical uh, and archaeological that uh, these claims are, you know, even the secular historians were saying that they worship Jesus as God within a, within a couple of decades after the time uh, of the, uh, the life of Christ. So it's like uh, no amount of uh, legend could have, not this amount of legend could have accumulated around his life uh, with that kind of uh, speed. So that leaves you in uh, this dilemma with the last one, which is Lord. So you can make him either a liar, you can make him out to be a lunatic, you can make him out to be a legend, or you can decide that he is exactly who he said to be. Lord, God, Savior. Uh, this um, has uh, created for many people a very compelling choice because the idea of him simply being a good sage or a moral teacher, they're taken off the table by Christ himself. He doesn't allow for those arguments to be made about him. Uh, with the very words that he spoke, he's saying, you can, you can put me in any of these categories you want. You can't say uh, that I was simply a, a good moral teacher trying to do uh, a little bit of good in this world and I was killed by an oppressive force that was more powerful than me. 
uh, he's taken away uh, those ideas um, for us. So that little summary statement in the bottom there, Jesus is the God-man. He's the God-man. The scholars talk about this as the incarnation, that in some mysterious way, God has united, the second person of the Trinity has united with humanity and become the God-man, which is essential, and we'll talk about this in future weeks, is essential to uh, the Christian teachings regarding uh, our hope and our salvation, uh, even our forgiveness. And so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in future weeks. But uh, that's it. Questions from you guys. Got a lot of questions in the first service. Many came through uh, the texting and a lot more uh, came uh, from the floor. So we'll take a few minutes here and answer uh, some of the questions you guys might have um, about uh, Jesus. Go ahead. Wow. Ow. Do you have to believe in the deity of Christ in order to be saved? You know, let's hold that question for Chris's week. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm um, sorry. Um, um, I want to say yes. I, I just, I, I only hesitate because... I don't want to. I don't want to put God in in a in a box of my own making. Um, early, in the early days of the church, not everyone would have come to this understanding all at once, and so it would have been uh, some years. I don't know when it was that it became an essential part. I do know that most every heresy of the early Christian church uh, dealt with. They took this issue of the nature of Christ. They either downplayed his deity or they downplayed his humanity which is why the early church councils were so careful in trying to preserve what the Bible teaches, because they, they knew that very quickly we go off the deep end on these things, and it has cascading ramifications for our doctrine of salvation. So I feel like the answer is yes, um, and it most likely is that way for today, uh, with the amount of uh, information that we now have at our disposal. I don't know exactly how that was for some of the early church um, and, and how long it took some of them to come to grips with it. Uh, it seems like the apostles uh, maybe were wrestling with it around the time of the resurrection. Uh, and so I think the, they struggled with it most likely until shortly after the resurrection when it all sort of started clicking for them and the, the lines were drawn between the Old Testament and the New Testament and I think, uh, you know, their teachings. And I think together they became sort of an essential part um, of it. I would be very hesitant if a person wanted to follow Christ but didn't understand this, this dimension. It, it complicates and compromises so many other parts of uh, Christian theology. So Now, I, I don't know if a heretic or not, but go ahead. I'm sorry. There is a, I mean, there is something very valuable about this idea of incarnation. The idea of God becoming flesh in our world is a huge motivator for the Christians to allow the word of God to be incarnated and fleshed in us. There's some sense in which we, we, we mirror this. With the spirit living in us, we're not, you know, we're not little gods. We don't teach that. But we do have somehow the, the spirit of God uh, enfleshed in us. He somehow made tangible. Uh, some have said the only Jesus many people will see is you. It's the work of Christ and the Spirit in your life flowing out. And so I feel like there is a, there is a, there is a powerful lesson of taking the kingdom of God in a spiritual and theological sense and living it out as a, in a very practical sense. I'd also say it means that we can't so readily quit we can't so readily say, oh, I'm just a, you know, uh, I'm just a human. You're, you're actually not just a human. You have been incarnated with the, the present, uh, presence of God in some unusual and powerful way. And we can't just simply say, now I'm not saying we'll be perfect. I, I, I know, but, uh, but I, I don't want us to so readily give up the fight against temptation and struggle and things like that. We do have 
spiritual resources that have been made alive in us, the presence of God. And so in that way, the, I think there could be some hope for us as well. Some other questions? Uh, one, uh, one of you have asked, uh, you have some arguments about why Jesus was not a liar or a legend. Do you have any good arguments as to why he, could, he couldn't have been crazy? That's a great question. Uh, because, of course, uh, you know, how, maybe he was. <laughs> They're like, put him in the lunatic category. Um, even a lunatic can, can, you know, can say some pretty great and compelling things. So I think that's a, it's a valid uh, question that we have to uh, wrestle with. I would say that the, one of the best testimonies for me are the group of followers that surrounded him. Meaning, if you were to really follow a lunatic, you would eventually see, uh, see some of this. This lunatic, Jesus, didn't simply claim it. He did crazy things like raise the dead. And he had power that was given uh, to him from God that even the religious leaders of his day had to say, listen, I know you're doing some pretty amazing things. You must have the power of God. So he didn't just, he, he backed it up with some pretty, pretty incredible works. So the quality of his teaching, the purity of his life, uh, the, the amazing power that he displayed, his resurrection, you know, usually crazy people can't pull that one off. <laughs> and remember, the entire early church saw it. They saw it. So now take a group of genuinely normal people who now were convinced that this guy, I mean, I think some points they probably did think he was crazy. I mean, the kinds of things he was saying, they must have been like, I don't even get this. This is going too far. Many of his disciples uh, turned away from him at some points because they just like, I, I just can't, he's too much. And yet after the resurrection, when these people saw him again, they were willing to lay down their lives. They were willing to die for their conviction that he was who he had claimed to be. And I think those together combined to form this really compelling argument that uh, crazy people don't do that. You know, I, I would say he, he was a little crazy, uh, in, but not in the lunatic sort of crazy way. I think he was, he was out there, and he, he said some, some amazing things and some challenging things, and he, he uh, you know, confronted the authorities and all of that kind of stuff. And so I think, uh, but he wasn't, uh, he has none of the other marks uh, of uh, really being uh, cognitively impaired or emotionally impaired in any sort of way, enough so that he could, he could mobilize a group of people to lay down their lives. All right, so that, I think, is about time. I think we are out of time. See that? So would you guys um, allow me to uh, pray for us here? Lord, we just take uh, a moment, and we thank you for uh, your word and the challenge that we have. Um, you have presented with us uh, a, uh, a line in the sand, a decision that each person needs to make. Will we keep you at arm's length, or will we embrace you as Lord? Will we bow our knee and our hearts? Will we worship you uh, as God and Savior? Or will we uh, reject and marginalize and put you in um, another safe and comfortable box? Lord, um, you have uh, drawn this out for us so that we might know who you are. And by knowing, uh, we might walk with God again as we did in the cool of the garden. We thank you and ask for the power of your spirit uh, to be making this alive and real to us. Amen.